They called her the female Charles Manson after she convinced her boyfriend to murder their roommates. But now, the same man who put her behind bars is fighting for her freedom. Was Sarah Jo Pender the puppet master behind a gruesome double homicide, or was she convicted on forged and tainted evidence? Thanks for stopping by. I'm Chris. Join us on this episode of True Crime Recaps as we uncover the truth behind one of America's most controversial inmates. It takes courage to admit when you're wrong. Most people are wrong about little things. They choose a lousy restaurant or they bet on the wrong team. Other people are wrong about major issues like evidence in a murder case. Larry Sells is a retired prosecutor from Marion County, Indiana. He specializes in murder, having prosecuted over 70 deadly cases in his career. Career. But one case sticks out among them all, and it's not because they murdered a bunch of people, it's not because they went on the run or got in a shootout with police, it's because Larry was wrong. In 2002, Larry convinced a jury that 21-year-old Sarah Jo Pender was the puppet master behind a gruesome double homicide. He pulled the trigger, but she pulled the strings, he said. He called her the female Charles Manson, a nickname that stuck even to this day. But now in 2023, Larry's looking back on the woman he sent to jail for 110 years. He's looking back on the evidence he now calls tainted. In fact, he's so convinced Sarah is innocent that he'd defend her himself. Sarah's story is the classic tale of the more you know. One set of facts paints picture A, while another set paints picture B. The difference between them is a life behind bars versus freedom. Sarah Jo Pender's life officially derailed on October 24, 2000, when her boyfriend and her roommate got into a fight over money and methamphetamine. At that at that time, Sarah was a high school grad who dropped out of Purdue University after her freshman year. She was 21 years old and falling in with the wrong crowd. She met her boyfriend, Richard Hall, at a Fish concert over the summer. He was a hulking man, a former high school football player with a long rap sheet. Richard had six misdemeanors and two felonies under his belt. Those felonies included auto theft and breaking and entering. He was working as a bouncer when they met, but he had bigger plans in mind. Richard and his best friend, Andrew Cattell, dabbled in the world of underground drugs. They were selling methamphetamine, but they were sick of the small-time profits. With the help of a chemist from Las Vegas, they set out to build and run a meth lab in their basement. They just needed a home to operate in. That said, few landlords are happy to lease their properties to convicted felons and drug dealers. Enter Sarah Pender and her clean record. Sarah signed a lease to rent a small, tidy, white home in Indianapolis, Indiana. Today, it's a parking lot down the street from Lucas Oil Stadium. Sarah, Richard, and Andrew lived there, along with Andrew's girlfriend, Trisha Nordman. She and Andrew had criminal histories themselves. Trisha did time for forgery, while Andrew served time for meth possession. The boys got cooking, but tempers soon flared. They fought constantly over money and power. The fighting got so bad that Richard wanted to buy a gun for protection. But because of his criminal record, he couldn't just walk into a store and buy one. So he and Sarah drove to a Walmart where she'd buy it for him. They walked in on the morning of October. October 24th, 2000. The clerk remembers Richard grabbing a bunch of 12-gauge deer slugs and bringing them to the counter. Sarah paid, and they left fully loaded. Later that night, Richard and Andrew went at it. As the story goes, Richard's sister owed Andrew drug money. Sarah decided to take a walk and let the guys work it out. While she was gone, Andrew went into Richard's room looking for the shotgun. They struggled, at which point Andrew threatened to kill Richard's whole family. Richard, who was about twice Andrew's size, pulled the gun away and shot him in the chest. Then he turned the weapon on Trisha, shooting her in the chest and head. Sarah came home to find Richard standing over the bodies of his best friend and his girlfriend. At that moment, the only thought in Sarah's head was, I'm about to die. But instead of escaping and calling the police, a misplaced sense of loyalty, terror, and sheer stupidity kept her there. She helped Richard load the bodies into a pickup truck, then drove with him to the closest dumpster where they tossed them in. The next day, half a mile away, an employee at a Teamsters building found the bodies. Thanks to their tattoos, they were easily identified as Andrew Cataldi and Trisha Nordman. It was no secret that they lived with Sarah and Richard. Meanwhile, back at the house, Sarah and Richard spent the next 
next 24 hours trying to clean up the crime scene. Richard tried burning several blood-stained items at his buddy's home in Noblesville, Indiana, a small city about 25 miles outside of central Indy. By then, police had already gotten a search warrant for Sarah's house. They weren't disappointed. Despite the cleanup attempt, there was still plenty of evidence found on the scene. DNA confirmed it belonged to Andrew and Trisha. At first, the police only arrested Richard. He denied any involvement, but changed his tune once they laid out the evidence against him. Four days after the murder, Sarah gave police a pair of Richard's bloodstained pants. They had him dead to rights, but they weren't done. Even though there was no DNA or direct evidence linking Sarah to the murders, they arrested and charged her all the same. 21-year-old Sarah Pender was staring down the barrel of a double homicide. Things weren't looking good for Sarah. She was the one who bought the murder weapon. She stayed and helped Richard clean up, even when she could have run and told the police. To his credit, Richard took the blame. He admitted his role in the killings and didn't implicate Sarah in any way. According to Sarah, they didn't speak for about four months. Then he began writing her letters. He was apologetic. He told her everything would be fine if she didn't testify against him. Sarah found herself in quite the dilemma. The only person who knew she didn't kill Andrew and Trisha is the man who did it. She didn't want to upset him, so she kept her mouth shut. Her day in court finally came. Larry Sells sat at the prosecutor's desk, waiting to make his case about why Sarah should spend the rest of her life in jail. He had two critical pieces of evidence. The first was a letter Sarah allegedly wrote to Richard while in jail. In it, she said, Andrew was so mean that night, I just snapped. I didn't mean to kill them. It must have been the acid. The letter went on to say, when you said you would take the blame, I knew then that you loved me deeply. An expert witness said the handwriting was in fact Sarah's. The second piece of evidence was sworn testimony from a convicted child awaiting trial for robbery. His name was Floyd Pennington. Floyd and Sarah met during a prison church event where they became pen pals. That relationship turned intimate and they were dying to see each other again. They made a plan to fake an illness on the same day so they'd wind up at the same hospital. Little did Sarah know she was being set up. Floyd was a snitch, the kind of guy who'd say anything to save himself. Before their fake illness, Floyd met with one of the detectives. He said he'd be able to coerce Sarah into admitting that she killed Andrew and Trisha, not Richard. Once they were alone, Floyd claims that Sarah admitted to planning the murders. She was there when Richard shot them. According to his testimony, Sarah didn't pull the trigger, but she had pretty much coerced Richard to pull the trigger. Sarah's letter and Floyd's testimony were enough. Larry Sells dubbed her the female Charles Manson, and the jury agreed. Sarah was found guilty and sentenced to 110 years in prison. Richard pleaded guilty to avoid trial. He played into the puppet master theory, claiming Sarah made him kill Andrew and Trisha. He got two 45-year sentences. Larry Sells had another successful conviction under his belt, but he may have just sent an innocent woman to jail. The innocent gears began turning in 2003. That's when Richard signed an affidavit saying he forced another inmate to forge the letter, the one that made it sound like Sarah confessed. He admitted he set her up so he could get a plea deal. He pointed out that he'd just killed his best friend and his girlfriend. He knew Sarah was scared enough for her own life that she'd do whatever he asked. Meet Steve Logan, a scrawny inmate with girlish handwriting. He and Richard shared a cell block in Marion County Jail. Richard admitted he showed Steve samples of Sarah's handwriting so he could copy it. According to reports, Sarah wrote most of her letters in cursive, except the letter that convicted her was neatly printed and legible. It seems Richard's conscience was bothering him. In his statement, Richard said, I have Drew and Trisha's lives on my hands. I can't have Sarah's. He wanted to do whatever it took to right those wrongs. Now, if you're not sure who to believe at this point, you're not alone. But this fact might help. There were only two sets of fingerprints found on that incredible incriminating letter, Richard's and Steve's. Sarah's fingerprints were nowhere near it. Unfortunately, at trial, Sarah's lawyer never raised the possibility the letter was forged. Ask anyone who's ever tried to be exonerated from behind bars. Once there's a verdict, good luck changing it. Even after Richard testified to forging the letter in 2005, it wasn't enough to move the needle on Sarah's freedom. She felt like the justice system had failed her, so she took matters into her own hands. In 2008, 
Sarah convinced a prison guard and an ex-inmate to help her stage an escape. On August 4th, 2008, the guard slipped Sarah a pair of civilian clothes in the prison gym. He then snuck her out in a van and dropped her off in a parking lot. From there, Sarah took off with Jamie Long, the ex-inmate and Sarah's former cellmate. For his role, the guard was supposed to make $15,000. Instead, he was seen on CCTV cameras, arrested, and charged with aiding a prison escape. He flipped on Jamie Long, who was arrested three days later. Meanwhile, Sarah made it to Chicago, where she went by the name Ashley Thompson. By September, Sarah was the most wanted woman in America. For four months, she worked as an estimator for a Chicago area contractor and tried to keep her head down, but her new life as Ashley Thompson didn't last long. In December, her neighbor recognized her on a rerun of America's Most Wanted. Just hours after the program aired, they called the police and Sarah was arrested again. She spent the next six years in solitary confinement at the Indiana Women's Prison. During the prison guard's trial, he used the female Charles Manson nickname against her. He claimed Sarah coerced him into helping her escape. He said Sarah seduced and manipulated him the whole time, just like she had manipulated Richard. During the America's most wanted episode, Larry said Sarah has a Charles Manson-like ability to manipulate people. He was about to regret those words. In 2009, Larry Sells stumbled on an important document called The Snitch List. It was two pages long and handwritten by Floyd Pennington. In it, he detailed all the drug dealers he knew and where they were slinging dope. Floyd gave the letter to Detective Ken Martinez, the man in charge of Sarah's case. At the end, Floyd wrote, I will help make buys, wear wires, talk on phone taps, or whatever I have to do to make busts on all these crimes. To Larry, this shattered Floyd's credibility as a witness. He'd clearly do anything to save his own skin. That included lying on the witness stand. Just because people swear to tell the truth doesn't mean they always do. Detective Martinez later moved to Ketchum, Idaho, where he was involved in an evidence mishandling investigation during an attempted murder case. Larry's doubts about Sarah Pender's guilt grew by the day. Even in retirement, he couldn't shake the feeling that Sarah was an innocent woman rotting in jail. One moment from the trial has always stuck out to him. They were breaking for recess. Larry was behind his table as guards were leading Sarah out of the courtroom. As she passed, she looked at him and said, Mr. Sells, I am not guilty. He responded, prove it. The law doesn't require Sarah to prove anything. In fact, the evidence that Larry used as proof was in his words, definitely tainted. In 2019, Steve Logan signed an affidavit saying Richard made him forge the letter. I believe I was bullied, manipulated, and coerced into writing this letter, he said. I am deeply remorseful for my stupidity. Sarah's case has now made its way to Georgetown University. Since 2018, law students have been taking a class called Making an Exoneree. The course has students dive into possible wrongful conviction cases and put together compelling evidence as to why that person should be exonerated. To date, the course has led to the freedom of five former prisoners. Sarah's case is among another five they looked at in 2023. Unfortunately, her story was left out of the 2023 Making an Exoneree Showcase in May. The student-made documentary on her case was not released to the public. As of now, she remains behind bars, but that doesn't mean people aren't still fighting. Now, with all that said, you probably have some thoughts, and you're not alone. Sarah's hands aren't totally clean. She did buy the gun that killed Andrew and Trisha. She did try to hide the bodies and help Richard get away with murder. She did escape from prison. She did do those things. But did she kill two people in cold blood, then let her boyfriend take the fall? That's for you to decide. Let's talk about it in the comments. And that's your recap. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, go ahead and tap that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss a story. We're here Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but don't go away. Catch up on more recaps right here, right now. Until next time, take care.